Okay. If you want to separate them, you have to. So they're they're constructively different. So right. if you did weird stuff like go to models of you could go to models of constructive logic, where where the two notions are different. Okay. How but, about any any normal real value metric space? Um, no, no, convergence and metastable convergence are just going to be equivalent, always. This is this is. Um, I can go through the proof. That's actually no, not no, no. Proof, I'm not complaining but, about the proof. I'm just trying to get a sense for what this notion does. So, and so it's the, the same in every so, example I've uh, ever looked at. So the difference is there are there are relatively easy to cook up sequences that converge, but where the rate of convergence is non computable. And the difference here is that n is oh. going to be computable from epsilon and f. Oh, f is again only uh, f is only a computable function. Doesn't matter in the state. So, so the, these sequences are real sequences? Also, it doesn't matter. Any sequence. I mean, this notion makes sense for any sequence, right? Oh, Whether it converges well, or not. Well, suppose these are integers sequences, then what does it mean to be less than epsilon? What well, is epsilon? Well, there are, there are no non-trivial sequences of integers that, con that converge. But, okay. but are there non-trivial sequences of integers that converge metastably? So, so if you have a if you have a sequence of integers, you can you can ask about convergence, right? It's not a hugely interesting question because it's it's equivalent to cons to constancy. But actually, you could have sequences of integers that converge non-constructively because they could sit around at some number for a long time and then jump, and you don't know where. Yeah. And this notion of metastability meta still makes sense. It says you can find long swaths where the se if the sequence converges, then you must be able to find long subsequence, long intervals where it's stable, even though you don't know that eventually it's not going to jump. So, so my question is still, what is I suppose when you're talking about the norm being less than epsilon, you're talking about at least some kind of a metric space, right? Yeah. So, can you give an example of a metric space and a sequence which converges metastably but does not converge? I guess obviously a sequence that converges does also converges mm -hmm. metastably. Maybe if you cook things up right and demand that f be computable, you could do such a thing. But actually, metastable convergence is general in most settings equivalent to convergence. The difference isn't with, in this case, they're true at the same time, but the bounds here are computable and the bounds for convergence aren't necessarily computable. So you think it's very hard to get that example? <laughs> I, well, I, I'm actually say, saying I, I, I'm actually saying that in most settings there aren't such examples and where you could cook one up um, it's also so interesting. So, so uh, really, by the way, Ashash, what time should I go to? About well, half an hour more. Okay. You're coming back at two or not? Well, two. That, that too, we can do that too. So, so in the examples this comes from, uh, what's going on is actually you're talking, your, your original structures are finite, and in a finite structure, Convergence isn't a very interesting property. So, right, so the point in a finite structure is you just wait for n to be, say, much bigger than the size of the structure, and you've gone through all possibilities, and so you sort of have to have converged. But that's, that's a trivial fact. And so what was going on was convergence in the, people were passing to an ultra product and using convergence of a sequence. And what, 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 what was it about this sequence that was relevant? Well, it wasn't convergence in the finite structures, because that was trivial. But those bounds on convergence in the finite structures, they depended on the size. right? So the bigger your finite structure got, the longer it was taking to converge. So it turned out that the fact you needed about the finite structures was exactly that you had uniform bounds on metastable convergence. That was the fact in the finite structures that was analogous to convergence in the ultra product. And that's the relationship between these statements. So 
one reason these ultra product proofs are useful. So there aren't actually that many theorems in the literature where the only known proof goes through ultra products. There are a few, but they're I having looked, they're, they're few and far between. And one of the reasons this seems to happen is because the ultra product proof uses very complicated statements. So there's an example from Bach space theory, uh, which is somewhat technical. It's the theorem that the James space is not locally unconditional. And I'm not going to explain any of those notions because they're not directly relevant. But conveniently, when you go through this proof, it turns out the main step is showing that two limits can, uh, two limits could be exchanged under suitable circumstances, right? So in general, you can't do that. But in a probability measure space, under suitable assumptions, you can use the radon nicodeme theorem to prove that these functions have to be converging to measures, and then the measures will commute. So the limits have to commute. And so it turned out that this theorem went that this theorem from about bottom spaces really went through this theorem. And the question was what, what's sort of going on at this level of uh, locality and uniform bounds? So if you unwind what this statement about limits is, the way it was being used uh, was like this. So there's more, a lot more quantifiers here, which is part of why I wanted to give this example. So when you're talking about limits, right, so to a logician, the statement that a limit is equal to something is both uh, a pi two and a sigma two statement, because you're saying both that something happens infinitely often and that it happens cofinitely. And what you want exactly is the equivalence between these two. So this translates into the fact that there's a bunch of different ways to talk about two limits converging. And you have to sort of go through, this, through and figure out which one you care about. And it turned out you cared about this one. So this says, well, for every epsilon uh, and every sort of starting points n and p, well, you can find this m and this q. So notice there's the m and there's the q. And then from some points later on, you can find an l and an s. So the thing that's important about this is m and q are relatively small, and s and l are relatively large. Right, so you're saying that you can have this integral with m small and s large, so you're early in the f sequence and late in the g sequence, or you can be early in the g sequence and late in the f sequence, and these should be equal reasonably often in some specific way. Yeah. So k doesn't appear in the uh, except when it's quantified. Oh, um, that, uh, that should say for, there exists an l greater than k. Yeah. L, uh, yeah, L should be greater than K, well, greater than L. Yeah. And that makes more sense. Yeah. All right. So if you apply the functional interpretation to this, you get something a little complicated with, with higher order functionals, which is the main point I want to make. So now you're, you end up saying, well, the epsilon and the n and the p just stay the way they are. But now, instead of having all these interleaved quantifiers, you actually have fewer quantifiers. You have for every epsilon, for every n and p, for every, let's say, suitable monotone, maybe you want them to be computable functions k and r. There exist, well, your m and your q, and also these functions l and s. And then you can calculate, and so this is exactly the same, but here we're saying you can actually calculate, uh, in particular, l and s from all these functions in a sort of complicated way. So you can see that k and r are supposed to depend on m and on q, as they do here. But they also, you sort of have to tell it in advance, well, once you tell me k and r, here is how I will calculate l. And so then they can depend on those functions as well. So there's this sort of complicated interleaving of dependencies going. This is, this is that price of the linear time translation that we have to go to these higher order statements. Um, but what's important and what gets used here is once you've gone to this statement, so first of all, you can look through the proof that this got used in, this unconditioned, local unconditionality of the James space, and you can figure out what K and R are. And actually, maybe not surprisingly, they're not very complicated. 
Like they actually don't depend very heavily on the other statements because they just cal need to do one particular calculation with them. And so the original statement only makes sense after you've passed from these, as it turns out, finite dimensional Banach spaces to an ultra product and you set up a measure space and do all this complicated stuff. This statement makes perfect sense in a finite space. So what happens in the proof is you say, instead of going to the ultra product, I could just go to a sufficiently large finite dimensional space for all these numbers to be reasonable sized numbers. And then I can carry out the rest of the proof as if I were in the ultra product. And this is exactly what happens. The bounds end up being Ackermannian incidentally. And this tends to come up a lot. Um, one more example just to illustrate how weird these things can, can look. So this is, so Hilbertianity is this notion that comes out of it's basically algebraic geometry. And so there's this nice characterization, there's a bunch of different characterizations, there's a nice one due to Gilmore and Robinson where they pass to an ultra product and actually it says, so field is Hilbertian exactly if there's some element in the ultra product, but that wasn't in the original field. So if you take this element in the ultra product and you add it, and you add it in and you take the algebraic closure, you don't really get anything new. This is telling you something about how the ultra product adds new elements to your structure. And if you write this out in this first order logic, logic -y way, um, and so I apologize, these EXs, these should be quantifiers of the natural numbers. I'm distinguishing between natural number quantifiers and, uh, and sort of conventional first order logic quantifiers. So in particular, um, notice that when we quantify over, say, k of t, well, you're quantifying over a ring extension, so you have to quantify over the degree of, of t in this element that you pick. Whereas when you quantify over an element of the ultra product, you're just quantifying over an element. So that's the distinction I'm making. Um, so you can write this out as some reasonable statement. And the functional interpretation tells you how to interpret it. So it tells you what is it about the original field that, so that causes this Hilbertian characterization in the ultra product. And it's not exactly pretty. Uh, I, I mean, there's a good re I think this sort of illustrates why you would rather, in most cases, go to the ultra product and work there rather than have to work with statements like this. Um, but actually, this really does tell us what the ultra products, what ultra products do for us. So how ultra products change results change statements. So what's maybe not obvious from this, maybe very little is obvious from this, but the important feature here is there's something subtle going on about the bounds where we have to select some numbers. We have to select two different numbers independently from each other, which is not something we normally do in mathematics. Usually we write our quantifiers in order. We select x and then y depends on x and then z depends on x and y. And it turns out in this statement, you actually want to pick two numbers that are fundamentally independent of each other. You want to be able to sort of pick a witness and a bound, and the bound shouldn't know what your witness is, but your witness also shouldn't know what your bound is. So that's what ends up getting wrapped up in all this complexity. And it's actually reflected in this original statement in a non op in a non-obvious syntactic way, which is there's this, this somewhat unusual feature that you have a quantifier over T, you quantify over an element of the ultra product, so you have sort of a conventional first order logic quantifier that is outside the numeric quantifiers. And so that's a little outside this pi 2n, pi 3n framework I was discussing. And so that's actually what becomes this uh, independence of parameters feature when you translate. So, so my advisor used to describe ultra products as black magic. And so one of the points I want to make is, is that actually the opposite is true. It turns out we understand now exactly what ultra products do in proofs. What ultra products do is they take these sort of very complicated statements about uniformity of bounds and you have these different functions that have to depend on each other in very elaborate ways and they translate them into things that look like ordinary math that are much easier to work with. 
And what the functional interpretation actually tells us is that's all that ultra products do. That everything going on in every proof with ultra products is just that the ultra product is taking all these details about bounds and how they depend on each other uniformly and just hiding them from us so we don't have to deal with them and we can focus on things that are easier to work with. And that's exactly the role of ultra products in mathematics. Outside of model theory and set theory, as I should certainly say here, because once you start looking at things that depend on the particular ultra filter and on saturation properties of the ultra product and so on, things get a little more complicated. There are very few results that do that outside of model. There are no results that I know of that do that outside of model theory and set theory. All right. So I thought I should close by point talking about Rittner theory entity, which is sort of an intermediate ground in complexity, as it turns out. So, so here I'm going to work on, in, I think I don't really need that. We could, this, this could be a differential polynomial extension. There could be multiple derivatives, uh, commuting derivatives at least. Uh, there's, I'm not demanding too much of the setting. And in the setting, we have uh, rid rod motion of variety. So if you have an increasing sequence of radical differential ideals, the sequence eventually stabilizes. Um, so, no theory entity like we write no theory entity like no theory entity, right? We use it to prove that that algorithms terminate, and we'd like to know how long they take. Uh, we certainly expect those bounds to be Ackermannian because, well, no theory entity certainly implies regular no theory entity, and we already know that has Ackermannian bounds. Um, there's this question of testing ideal membership in an ideal. So in the algebraic case, I just said, well, we know we can reasonably quickly test membership in an ideal using Grubner bases, so we'll just take that as given. But for the applications we were looking at, um, we're looking at using no theory entity to prove the null zots, which is what you would need to be able to test membership. So we didn't want to assume that membership was, gi that membership was given that we wanted to treat testing membership as an existential statement. You need to find witnesses to show that some, that elements belong to some differential ideal. And the way to think about this is to say, well, we should test for membership. Uh, we, we tested, we're testing for it, I think. We're still playing around with how we're writing it up, but probably something like this. So we want to say, you don't, membership in a differential ideal has a quantifier over natural numbers in it. So you say F is, in a, in a particular differential ideal with bounds less than d if you only need derivatives of order up to d. You can play around with exactly how you define this and what you count and what you don't. I probably mean the radical ideal generated by that rather than the ideal generated by that. This is what I need to aim for. <clears throat> All right. So what's important here is that written theory entity, given that interpretation of ideal membership, becomes a pi 4 statement instead of a pi 3 statement. So there's another round of quantifiers. And so the statement ends up looking like this. So you want bounds over the degree and the order of your polynomials. You could merge those into one, into one bound if you wanted. And you want this function f that we've seen before. And we're going to get a, just like before, we're going to get a bound m, and we expect sort of local written no theory entity up to a bound m. Um, but we also have to give a new value. We need to give this bound l. And what l is going to do is it's going to say, and so what do we want? We want to say that the ideal f of m is conta already contained in the ideal m. That's the property we would expect to have. But we need to say something stronger. We want to say, also, we don't need to use too many derivatives to do that. Right, so we're going to say how far out we're going to go before we check that. Uh, and the problem, of, the problem that makes this more complicated is once you throw L in, now everyone else gets to look at L. So D gets to look at L. Your bounds on degrees and orders get to look at L. Your function F gets to look at L. So you get a somewhat more complicated statement. Um, but the claim is, and so what we're sort of working out in detail, is that whenever you have a proof of a Pi 2 statement that uses written, writ rod and bush and theory entity, this is the statement, this is the constructive statement that is good enough to get your proof. So despite its complexity, M and L can actually be computed 
from the bounds O, D, and F. In general, these are going to be Ackermannian. They're almost always going to be Ackermannian. In general, they'll be somewhat complicated, but in most applications, O, D, and F are reasonably straightforward, as it turns out. And then you can apply you can apply this to get actual bounds out of statements that use an Ethereum. And uh, do you distinguish a special case of bound derivation oh. in these bounds? Um, we're not. It's, I mean, you're not going to get, I don't think you're going to get meaningfully different bound. It's, it is already going to be pretty bad with one derivation. That's really what I should say. So at that point, why, why bother? The proofs are a little simpler if you, if you stick to one derivation, but not so much that it, I think we're going to actually write it out. Yeah. So let me just try to parse what's happening here. You are thinking of your sequence of increasing radical ideals as being given by sets of generators, yeah. in some sense computably so. Yeah. And what you are saying is that um, rather than saying if the ideals are really contained in each other, then they really stabilize from here onwards, you are saying if the ideals contain are if uh, an earlier, if every earlier ideal is contained in every later ideal up to some level of generation, then it stabilizes for a certain amount of time up to some level of generation. So I, I'm assuming actual containment. I mean, oh, 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 sorry, sorry. You're assuming actual containment witnessed by right. this many um, steps of generation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm, no. No, I'm, I'm promising containment. So I'm, I'm assuming actual have... containment. So actual containment... You don't have to set it up this way, but it was easy to promise actual containment because if they're given by generators, you just assume every set of generators proof, um, includes the previous ones. What, what I'm promising is that I can find some point in my sequence so that I can go much later, yeah. and this later thing is contained in the earlier one, and furthermore, I'm promising that it is contained in the earlier one without too many, taking too many directions. Ah, okay, so, I see. So, yeah. so, the issue so is, it I'm, might be, you might not be able to ever get to containment actually forever with this few derivatives. Right. But you can get containment for a long time with few derivatives. Right. So again... I assume you mean here H being generators, because otherwise you could have arbitrarily large. Um, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I'm I'm being bad, and I'm equating my ideal with my generators here, and I shouldn't. I mean that, yeah, I do mean that if H is a generator of I F of ML, then it's in there. So, so I'm not I'm not following the little M less than or equal to the capital M. Yeah. So. There's a technicality, which is so my my bound my I get a bound. Mm -hmm. So because the degree and the order bounds so the bound have is to no depend worse on worse than this capital M, you're saying in some right. sense, in some sense. But then but then you also can push it up with the functions, right? M and yeah. L. I mean the, the function yes. L, for example, you can. Right. So L, well, yeah. So L gets to gets to be if O and D are big, then L gets to sort of be right. bigger based on. Right. It, and it, it could be my, my uh, let's see. So, so the issue here is because so before when I stated it, I just said so I. Can, I mean, I, I don't understand the force of this M less than or equal to M. Is that because you can then find it because you can compute capital M first and therefore then so, you can just exhaust and so and big look up for a little M. So big M is supposed to. Be compute. So, so what's going on here is that the, the order of dependencies is important. Right. So because O and D have to depend on L, mm -hmm. I don't just want to, it wouldn't make sense to look at just one sequence. Right. So what I'm claiming here is if you take O, D, and F, there's an M and L that will work for any sequence of ideals. But I'm not promising that every possible sequence of ideals has one of these sort of stable intervals in exactly the same place, because that's actually not true. 
what I'm promising is they all have some position by that point. So there's some latest time by which they will have or they will have some stable interval. So the idea here is really that big M is independent of the sequence of ideals. Right. Once I know big M and big L, I know what I mean by a sequence of ideals that sort of grows slowly enough. And then once I've seen that sequence, I can find the particular little m that works for that sequence. No later than the bit bound that I was promised. Why do you simply just put a capital M instead of a little m in the, in the last statement then? Um, is that, that, that's actually not true. Um, so the issue is my, my sequence of ideals could sort of be stable for a while and then add stuff and then be stable for a while and then add stuff. And what I'm promised is that basically there are what I'm, the way the proof is going to work is I'm going to look at a bunch of different places and I'm going to say, maybe it's stable here. And if it's not, maybe it's stable here. If it's not, maybe it's stable here. And one of these places must work and there's finitely many of them. Ah, so you're saying that the, the little m depends on the sequence i. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Whereas capital M does not. Exactly. So. Could you be the other way in some sense that, okay, so, so if you look at all the sequences um, and all is M, uh, then you're saying that all those M's are, can be bounded by something called M. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. But yeah. I didn't want to Yeah, so, so, turn it, so it's not, ob I mean, it's not, immediate how you prove this from even the statement of written theoriality. That's not too hard. Uh, and certainly the proof of this is not, and sort of taking the proof, of, taking Roddenbush's proof and sort of unwrapping it into a proof of this is not, not completely trivial. When, when you, the, the last statement that says that um, not only are um, the elements or the generators in from the earlier thing, but you, you don't have to you don't have to uh, differentiate the too many. Yeah. Too many times. Do you have the bound on what too many is? I mean, that's L, but yeah. like, you know what that is. Or... So, <laughs> so I, I have the I have the proof written down without bounds right now because I need I need William to do a bunch of calculations before I can write down the bounds. But um, the the um, it's it's. What what you expect to happen, and what I assume will happen, is that L is going to take these values and F, and it's probably going to iterate F over and over again, um, probably a, say, Ackermannian number of times. I, I expect the underlying bounds to be basically Ackermannian. I actually sort of know that they'll be okay. basically Ackermannian. And so what's going to happen is M and L are going to come about by like, iterating the functions O, D, and F over and over again until they get, until they sort of force that at some point they must, this kind of local stability must have happened. So this is, this is the last slide, by the way. Thank you very much. More questions? Why, um, why, why is the function O and D have two parameters? Um, I think I may have said this wrong. They may need to also depend on big M, actually. Um, so I is tell, so there are functions that should tell you for each, um, for each ideal how big that ideal can be. So that's the I. But they're also allowed to depend on L. Very funny because L depends on O and D and F, of course. So now you're saying that. Yeah. So this is the this is this functional okay. interpretation that you get. Yeah. As you get beyond Pi three statements, you really get these functions on higher types, where you get functions that depend on functions. I guess the one thing to think about is um, if you write this out with the quantifiers, you're saying something like. Um, Can you write out that word? Oh, sure. Sorry. 
Can I erase this? So if you write this out with quantifiers, you're saying something like for every sequence, uh, and well, if you know the sequence, you know the bounds O of i and D of i. Um, there exists an M for all n greater than or equal to M. Um, L so that I of N is contained in, uh, here I mean the generator's I N. So if you write this out, you get something like this. Um, and the idea is L, right, L is sort of the biggest number, it depends on everything else, right? You don't have to know what L is until someone has told you what is M, what is N. And what we're doing is we're saying that L then becomes a function that depends on what the previous values are. And then O and D end up being allowed to depend on this function, not on a particular value of the function, on the function itself. So they can somehow apply the function repeatedly to get to whatever value they want to get to. And then L looks at the numbers they give and calculates some number. No, my, my question is how how is O and D possibly be given? Um, so for example, I mean, O might say take the function L and iterate it two times. O doesn't. Oh, oh no no no! I, I don't know when I when I give you O and D, I don't know L. Right. So O says iterate whatever function L is. I don't know who it is, but iterate it twice. Okay. I see. I see. That's an example. Or yeah. iterate i times or something. Yeah. Like yeah. Uh, and so, so the idea is, you might imagine that what O is doing is O is O is looking at L. It's not given anything. So think about think about. How I mean, when, when you say you're given a function O. Yeah. I mean, you can't say I specify with a parameter that I don't even know. Is that right? Can you? Oh, yeah, maybe you can. Yeah, of course you can. Okay. You can say O is going to yeah. call function foo that yeah, right. Bob okay. is programming, and I don't know what foo does. Yeah, okay. And if Bob changes his foo, my function will change. Okay. <laughs> so in some sense, the O here and the E here implicitly still actually depends on the sequence i that you give, since the l, oh no, gosh, that's it. So I'm, I'm not following the logic here. So, so the, these higher order statements are really come weird. kind of recursively done, so that you don't really know exactly um, what can be given and what uh, can be computed. So, so what has to happen here is O, o is somehow this you have an example? That, I mean, of course, you're saying read, read the theory in the end here. But, uh, two, well, two months, we'll have, we'll have the example all written down. <laughs> right. So, we're, so we're, we're writing up sort of an actual example, and you know, we have to use this. And but you see, this is the definition. So how do you how does how does how does the, the read the theory in the actually fit into this setting? So I mean, locally. Ooh, what do you mean? Well, I mean, you say this is local. So, so the global linearity should fit into this setting, right? So, oh, no. Well, so by local, it's I mean the, other, the sense it's the of other, these it's local the other, conversions. It's the other way. Right? Yeah. The other way, right? yeah. Okay. Well, we we'll think about it over lunch. <laughs> it's complicated enough that we couldn't repeat this thing. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's complicated enough I have to look it up every time. Yeah. I, I have to use it. So. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.